We turn now to a sweeping climate change declaration issued by the world's leading Islamic scholars, calling on the world's 1.6 billion Muslims to do their part to eliminate dangerous greenhouse gas emissions and turn towards renewable energy sources. The declaration urges world leaders meeting in Paris later this year to commit to a 100 percent zero emission strategy and to invest in decentralized renewable energy in order to reduce poverty and the catastrophic impacts of climate change. The declaration comes on the heels of the publication of Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment earlier this year, which also calls for sweeping action on climate change. Like the encyclical, this declaration, endorsed by more than 60 leading Islamic scholars, links climate change to the economic system, stating, quote, we recognize the corruption that humans have caused on the earth due to our relentless pursuit of economic growth and consumption. It places special emphasis on richer countries and communities, noting that the risks of climate change are, quote, unevenly distributed and are generally greater for the poor and disadvantaged communities of every country at all levels of development. To talk more about the significance of this declaration, we go to London to speak with Salim al Haq, one of the contributors and signatories to the Islamic Declaration on Global Climate Change, a climate scientist at the International Institute for Environment and Development in London and director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. Salim al-Haq, welcome to Back to Democracy Now! Talk about what prompted the declaration, who wrote it, and who were the major signatories on it. I think the origin of this came some uh, few months ago, when the Climate Action Network, uh, a group of uh, climate activists, got together with the Islamic Relief Worldwide, a humanitarian Islamic uh, organization that does quite a lot of work with vulnerable communities around the world. and they agreed that this was something that they should take up and got in touch with Islamic scholars and leading clergy around the world and started drafting a potential declaration of this kind. And then they held a two-day symposium in Istanbul, which ended just a day or so ago, uh, where they brought about 60 international scholars, Muslim scholars, uh, leading clergy from different countries, and we and in, invited me as a climate scientist to join them, also a Muslim as well. Uh, and we honed the final declaration, which came out and has been released. And it's aimed very much at uh, the 1.6 billion Muslims around the world, uh, bringing to their attention the verses of the Holy Quran, which enjoin Muslims everywhere to preserve the environment as stewards of the environment, and at the same time not cause harm to other people by their own pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. And so, at a personal level, to reduce our emissions, and at a global level, to join efforts by all faiths and all countries to bring down the fossil fuel use uh, to zero I as soon as possible. Well, last month, Democratic presidential candidate Martin O'Malley made headlines by suggesting that the rise of the so-called Islamic State came about in part because of the effects of climate change. He was speaking on Bloomberg TV. One of the things that preceded the failure of the nation state of Syria and the rise of ISIS was the effect of climate change and the mega drought that affected that region, wiped out farmers, drove people to cities, created a humanitarian crisis that created the symptoms, or rather the, uh, the conditions of extreme poverty that has led now to, to the rise of ISIL and this extreme violence. Dr. Salim al -Haq, your response, I mean, to what extent do you think the conflicts in Syria, Iraq, etc., Yemen, are exacerbated by climate change? Can the creation of ISIS really be attributed to the effects of a changing climate? I think there's—I don't think there's a direct attribu attribution of the rise of ISIS as an organization uh, to climate change, but there is no denying the underlying uh, logic of the statement that we just heard, which is that there was a continuing drought for quite a few years in Syria that predates the conflict, the civil war and the rise of ISIS, and caused migration and refugees going from the rural areas to urban areas. And that's the kind of thing that climate change is likely to cause in future and almost certainly will cause future conflicts. And, uh, Dr. Huck, what does the declaration call on uh, some of the Muslim-majority oil-producing countries uh, uh, to do? Uh, they're the ones with among the least incentives to cut down on fossil fuels, since they're dependent on them for their economy. Well, first of all, it enjoins all the Muslims in those countries, as individuals, to do what they can to reduce their own carbon footprints and also to help their fellow Muslims, who very often are amongst the most vulnerable people to the impacts of climate change, people like 
Muslims living in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, my country, and in parts of Africa. Many of these are Muslims who are suffering the consequences. And therefore, those of us who are better off have a, a duty to help them, protect them, and to stop causing the pollution that is causing the impacts on them. And at the same time, hope to influence the leaders of these countries that it's in their own best interest to move away from fossil fuels in the long run. And indeed, this is beginning to happen. If you look at the leaders of Abu Dhabi, for example, they are investing heavily in solar energy and in renewable energy, because they know that their oil is not going to last forever. Salim Mohawk, we want to thank you for being with us, one of the contributors and signatories to the Islamic Declaration on Global Climate Change, climate scientist at the International Institute for Environment and Development in London, director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh.